6 p.m. on Monday. Uh, we have enough teams such that if we keep to the 15-minute time limit, we will be done by 9 p.m. That means I will be very strict about time, uh, and I'll cut you off at 12 minutes, uh, even if you're not finished with your presentation, so we can have time for questions. So in other words, uh, please practice and make sure you'll be able to uh, present on time. And of course, I'll also look forward to receiving your reports next week. So uh, last time we had uh, an overview of the properties of networks of nanostructures. And you know, really, this should be a longer topic, but we got to learn a little bit about uh, what dominates the electrical, thermal, and mechanical characteristics of groups of nanostructures put together in generally a random configuration. So we talked about films and also kind of volumetric assemblies. And we focused our discussion uh, with a lot of examples from carbon nanotubes uh, because they have properties that are interesting in all these three areas. And so just to recap briefly, we saw that in the case of electrical properties, uh, the electrical transport in a network exhibits a what per behavior called percolation, where you go from having no conductivity at a very low concentration of the filler of the nanowires or nanotubes, for example, to a sharp transition in the conductivity when you form that first connecting path across uh, your film, for example. And then uh, the formation of the percolation network, the initial crossing of this threshold, is just geometrically determined based on the size and shape and the random position of the fillers. And then the conductivity value and the scaling behavior depends on many things, the geometry, the transport within the individual nanotubes, for example, their defect density and quality, as well as the contact resistance between the structures. And that can be based on direct contact, or as we saw, it can also be based on how the surrounding medium interacts. There might be some polymer in the gap, there might be some amorphous junk in the gap, and there are many cases of that. When we talked briefly about thermal properties, this is a much more, I think, a complex issue that is somewhat beyond our scope, but we saw the dramatic differences in thermal conductivity that could be seen, for example, for individual nanotubes or tightly packed nanotubes where there are a lot of junctions imposed upon them. And that emphasized the fact that scattering of phonons in networks of nanostructures is often a dominant attribute of the thermal conductivity of the assembly. And it was interesting that while one carbon nanotube could have a thermal conductivity uh, about 3,000 watts per meter Kelvin, uh, uh, almost uh, if not higher than that of diamond, a well-packed tangled mat had a thermal conductivity less than that of some typical polymers. And then we also briefly talked about mechanical properties and more in the idea of visualizing nanostructures as networks of springs. And in this case, while there are a lot of different types of contact in the case of electrical and thermal properties, you can have tunneling or you can have communication of vibrations across, across gaps, it's really the you know, interaction, the connection of the structures that matters in a mechanical case. And when we looked at examples for, of uh, the, the production of threads or yarns out of carbon nanotubes, we saw, for example, the limiting cases of having very high strength where you were pulling on a large number of continuous nanotubes in parallel and much lower strength when you were pulling on a longer distance and therefore the strength was dominated by the strength of the interconnections among the tubes. And uh, you know, aside from the specific physics of scaling and interactions, uh, I feel like a, 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 an important moral of this story is that we are yet uh, to achieve sort of true bulk scalability of the properties of a lot of the structures, the structures in any of these cases. So we saw, for example, taking a, a map of uh, published uh, experimental data from uh, assemblies of carbon nanotubes, particularly designed to uh, maximize their electrical transport, maximize their electrical conductivity. It's been verified that the transport through individual nanotubes can match theoretical predictions and, in fact, be higher greater than copper at short distances of ballistic transport, but by and large assemblies of nanotubes, ribbons or aligned layers or tangled layers, do not achieve the conductivity that would be predicted for equivalent packing fractions if you said what would the conductivity be if you scaled up a bunch of perfect nanotubes in parallel kind of in a wire. And uh, likewise in the case of mechanical properties of assemblies of nanotubes, now we see a map uh, comparing the specific modulus or the uh, uh, Young's modulus E divided by the density rho uh, versus the specific strength in gigapascals divided by kilograms per cubic meter. And this, of course, is a common Ashby-type chart where you have these bubbles that represent the different 
groups of materials, and if we take the idea that individual nanotubes have been measured to have density normalized strength and stiffness uh, far ahead of steel, of uh, two or one order of magnitude higher, uh, that has been verified just as in the case of electrical or thermal properties, but for example, the properties of assemblies of nanotubes, fibers of nanotubes, are at least an order of magnitude below that in both regards. And my bet is that in the next few years, this will push up somewhat, but just because of, of, of physical and geometric considerations, we probably will never make a cable of nanotubes that's as strong and stiff as an individual nanotube. And there are, of course, a lot of other nanotube assemblies, the tangled films and forests and things like that. And by packing nanotubes in different ways, you can generally span this whole space. You can have things that are more foam-like and things that are more metal-like. Uh, but if the end goal is to make sort of the super strong cables, there's a lot of interesting progress in that area, but we're not quite uh, and may never quite be to the individual nanotube level. And incidentally, the properties of advanced fibers, things like carbon fibers and glass or, and, and polymer fibers, aramid and Kevlar, are uh, uh, in fact a bit higher in the strength area than the best nanotube fibers. And making fibers out of polymers and pyrolysis of carbon is still now much more cost effective than the, the properties of, of nanotube fibers, although perhaps the combinations of electrical properties and mechanical properties uh, in nanotube fibers are making them attractive for some applications such as lightweight wires uh, for things like wiring harnesses and airplanes. So uh, in the last lecture today, uh, what I've chosen to do is to take us few through a few case studies, uh, several recent papers, uh, and explore how balances among the types of interactions we've emphasized in the lectures so far uh, are exploited for different self-assembly and nanomanufacturing processes. Uh, and uh, this is supported by a bunch of papers that I'll post on C-Tools later today. These would be, you know, uh, sort of unofficially the readings for the course uh, today. So uh, what we're discussing today gets back to this idea of self-assembly in that we want to balance uh, different types of attractive and repulsive interactions to achieve a finally highly ordered state. And uh, in often cases to have this sort of in situ error correction or evolution of a final, uh, of a system toward a final ordered equilibrium, we want to have reversibility in the uh, association of the structures based on these different types of interactions. And you know, we didn't talk so much about like the ideal of molecular self-assembly, like you know, having two uh, molecules dock to each other. But you know, in general, if you have a specific uh, atomic structure, a molecule, it will have some intermolecular interactions due to the distribution of electrons and charge uh, uh, and, and its tendency to bond with other molecules that are generally fixed. You know, molecule A might associate with molecule B in a specific way. Uh, but by creating supermolecular structures, building blocks, chains or nanotubes or nanoparticles, and by uh, playing with their surfaces, playing with their environment, and applying external conditions, uh, we can generally seek to engineer the magnitudes of these interactions. And the magnitudes depend on the characteristics of the structures themselves and also on the conditions that we're talking about. So that's a more a broader view on you know, what is going on in the effort toward controlling interactions to achieve self-assembled structures. And if we consider this exploration today as kind of like looking at different terms in the balance, we're going to see some of the terms that we're familiar with, and we'll see some other terms pop up, and they're just other types of interactions or energies that might be exploited or might be important for resulting in a final self-assembled state. So on this slide, I've just kind of grouped them uh, into uh, interactions that are non-bonding and bonding interactions. We've sort of assumed in many cases when chemical bonding happens, it happens, but we haven't talked about specific types of bonding. But today we'll focus on these kind of, uh, here what I'm calling locally controlled interactions, things that are sort of determined by uh, the, the structure itself, intermolecular or van der Waals adhesion forces, elastic forces, so now energy caused by, say, deformation of filaments. If you bent a nanotube or bent a nanopillar, there would be some elastic energy, and, and, and kind of like our old uh, van der Waals switch problem, whether that exceeds or is less than, say, an adhesion energy or a capillary force might determine whether filaments aggregate together in a particular process we're going to study. 
There are also, of course, electrostatic forces induced by surface charge, uh, either like charges or opposite charges, and also you know, steric hindrance, the general idea of entropic things that cause uh, chains to want to curl up or uh, prohibit them from unfurling or assign an energetic cost to straightening them out. And those are also important in aspects of polymer self-assembly. And then uh, we haven't really addressed these methods of applying remote control. And, 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 and the idea of remote control I mean here is uh, using an external force or an external field applied to the environment to either, say, tune one of these interactions or apply an external influence that might uh, adjust the balance between interactions or add something else to the equation. So this could be, for example, applying an electric field or a magnetic field. Uh, if the particle has some magnetic properties, for example, applying fluid flow, applying agitation, uh, for example, ultrasonic vibration to kind of shake things up and maybe push particles outside of holes that don't fit so well and put them into holes that fit better than that, uh, as well as maybe changing the temperature. And we'll see examples today of not uh, all of these, but some of them, and how they can be used to uh, so sort of disrupt or exploit or change the balances and the influence of local interactions. And uh, you know, generally we could draw a bunch of you know, sp spectra or axes that try to compare the strengths and scalability of these interactions. And really, uh, it's hard to do that universally. In other words, to say you know, the van der Waals forces are always stronger than the electrostatic forces and so on. We know it depends on a lot of effects. But you know, in general, if we look at this spectrum, which comes out of a book on the molecular biology of the cell and is meant to talk about kind of like bonding interactions, things that happen in, in biochemistry, we see that things that we work with generally in self-assembly, these local interactions, these reversible interactions, have an, a, an energy value or equivalently perhaps a force value somewhere between the value of the thermal energy of the system and the value of energy that would be uh, released or needed to form a chemical bond. So we're somewhere on the spectrum between chemical bonding and thermal vibration. And if you have too much thermal energy in the system, then you're not likely to get the structures to settle due to these local non-bonding, non-specific interactions. On the other hand, if you have a case where the molecules want to bond together, then those can be very, very strong and specific interactions and can overwhelm the tendency of structures to want to attract or push away due to van der Waals and electrostatic forces. And there are strategies, for example, that we'll see at the end of the lecture, for example, controlling the temperature to induce uh, things like hybridization and dehybridization of DNA, which is exploiting a particular type of DNA base pairing interaction and the coding of DNA to achieve uh, self-assembled structures and patterns. So it's generally these weak, uh, relatively weak to bonding, non-covalent interactions that are used in self-assembly and they're used in most of the examples that we're going to see today. <clears throat> so I have about five uh, case studies and you know we'll go as far as we can get and if you have uh, any questions about particular ones, so please ask and we can, we can discuss the processes a bit more. Because uh, I think they're all pretty interesting and kind of take a different flavor on, on, on uh, the, the different types of uh, interactions that dominate between different structures. So the first process we'll discuss is uh, we'll continue uh, what was shown in the lecture, I guess, uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and this process uses kind of a hierarchical uh, uh, sphere assembly to create eventually rings of quantum dots on a substrate. And you remember that what the researchers did is they took a solution uh, consisting of polystyrene microspheres, uh, things maybe a micron or less in diameter that are, need to be pretty monodisperse, and quantum dots that are uh, an order of magnitude or smaller in size. So maybe 10 nanometers versus a few hundred nanometers. And uh, they made this solution, and, and of course, to make the solution stable, the polystyrene spheres and the quantum dots have to have like charge. So there's electrostatic repulsion between them. And then they disperse them on a glass substrate, and by the, the, the sort of magic of evaporative self-assembly, the drying interactions, the capillary interactions that we discussed two lectures ago, and we'll see more of in a minute, uh, influence the assembly of the spheres into this hexagonally packed layer. Uh, 
as well as the assembly of the nanoparticles into rings kind of trapped underneath the microspheres. So here we see a schematic of as the drying process occurs, uh, maybe it first pulls the microspheres together and then it pulls the quantum dots underneath the spheres like so. So then after doing this assembly, this evaporative assembly, they take a piece of tape and they peel away the microspheres and end up with these quantum dot rings uh, on the substrate. And for example, the concentration of spheres uh, by number is in their experiments about uh, 10 to the 10th or 10 billion per milliliter and the concentration of quantum dots is about a factor of 1,000 to 10,000 higher. So for example, by controlling that concentration ratio of the quantum dot uh, to the polystyrene sphere, they're able to demonstrate that they control the thickness of the rings. And so here, uh, the descending curves A, B, C, and D correspond to these ratios. And uh, these curves are AFM height images taken just by scanning the AFM tip across the surface and producing this image. And these scans are line scans taken across a cross section of each of these rings. And what this data is showing is that uh, in all these experiments they use the same size of sphere, but if you have more quantum dots in the solution, you end up with a taller ring and also a wider ring. And uh, they even discuss that uh, they believe this is a certain number of rows of quantum dots stacked up fairly well, and by decreasing the concentration, they end up with these fairly rough uh, structures, sometimes consisting of just single dots around the ring. And we can also see from this data that the, the uh, profile of the ring, the topography of the ring, uh, agrees for all the different concentrations, meaning they're actually kind of physically templating the surface of the sphere. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, they mentioned that in the case of the smallest image here, uh, what's limiting the resolution of their image is the radius of the AFM tip, because the quantum dots are only a few nanometers in size, I think between five and 10 nanometers, and uh, their uh, image is kind of blurred by the fact that their AFM tip has a radius of 20 to 30 nanometers. So by just varying this concentration and keeping the sphere size the same, they're able to change the size of these different rings. And uh, they also talk about how by keeping the concentration of the quantum dots the same, uh, yet changing the diameter of the polystyrene spheres, they can make rings of different diameters. Uh, and uh, this is just related to a simple geometric argument that if you have here in this case, you know, ideally a single quantum dot, like the one that can get closest, farthest underneath, uh, you can do uh, triangle math and predict the radius of the ring you would get as a function of the radius of the polystyrene microsphere, RMS, and the radius of the quantum dot, RQD. And so by uh, making, uh, doing experiments with different uh, sizes of microspheres, just buying different solutions of microspheres of different sizes and creating the same dispersion, but keeping the concentration of the quantum dots uh, the same in each case, they show that they can change the diameter of the ring. And you also see that the height of the ring changes, but here they're really concerned and as the diameter as the kind of inside to inside distance of the ring. And the plot at the right shows this simple geometric equation and you can see that they get a fairly good agreement between their experimental data, the measured width of these rings, uh, as a function of the radius of the microspheres they used and the uh, upper and lower bounds are uh, curves calculated for uh, quantum dots of different radii, and that's just done to bound it given their known polydispersity of the structures they have in solution. So just by kind of changing these, these, these two parameters, there's just a simple geometric effect going on here. The number of dots that exist and the number of dots that pack under the spheres, as well as the location at which they pack, dictated physically by the size of this template. And uh, so, sorry, I had a mis uh, mistake slide in there. So uh, the other thing that's important to get this assembly process to occur is uh, that there is a balance of forces and a balance of interactions in the system. And we can imagine that if 
for example, there was a gigantic repulsive force between the polystyrene spheres and the quantum dots, the, particle, the quantum dots wouldn't want to go down and shove themselves under the spheres. Uh, likewise, if there was a different balance of interactions, maybe you wouldn't get such uniform assembly. Or if there was a strong adhesion between the quantum dots and the substrate, uh, maybe some of them would get in there, but some of them would stick on the substrate. And uh, they also go through a very nice discussion of the balance among the three main types of interactions here. And so the first interaction that's at play are the capillary forces. And they are attractive because as the liquid evaporates, the meniscus withdraws and creates a capillary pressure that essentially pulls the quantum dot down into the space between uh, the sphere and the substrate. And you know, maybe it's up here a bit or down here a bit, but when it's close to the substrate, we can approximate it as being kind of dragged in on the surface. And just by simple first order approximation, we can relate the capillary force per unit length to the contact angle between the water and the cadmium selenide uh, nanoparticle uh, to the radius of uh, the, uh, the distance between uh, uh, the center of the quantum dot and the meniscus here, which can be approximated as the radius of the quantum dot, uh, as well as the surface tension of the liquid or the surface tension at the water-air interface. And so for uh, a, a, a radius of 4 nanometers or an R of 4 nanometers, which is for their system, they calculate that this capillary force is uh, no more than 1.6 nanonewtons. But in fact, that uh, force is very much larger than the thermal energy. So we see that by orders of magnitude, the, ma the capillary forces are way stronger than the thermal energies uh, in this system. And you know, the, the magnitude nanonewtons really doesn't mean much for us here, but now we can see how that compares relatively to the magnitudes of the other interactions in the system. So the, the second type of interaction that's at play here uh, are, is the adhesion forces or the attractive force and attractive energy, for example, between the quantum dot and the substrate. And certainly there's also an attractive force between the sphere and the quantum dot, but we're talking about between the quantum dot and the substrate here because that's something that can act against the capillary force and kind of retard the assembly. So this is calculated simply for uh, the van der Waals attraction between a sphere and a plate, so using the equations that we derived many weeks ago. And uh, using these parameters, uh, they calculate the adhesion force, the van der Waals force, to be about 0.3 nanonewtons. And an interesting aspect of that is that uh, you have to consider, like, we know that in the van der Waals equation, a really important parameter is the effective spacing between the, 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 the structure and the substrate. So they approximate that given the known thickness of the ligands or the monolayer that they functionalize the nanoparticle with it so it will be negatively charged in solution. And then the third force at play is the electrostatic force. And this is a case where uh, you have repulsion between the uh, quantum dot and the polystyrene sphere. And the way that this is derived is a bit more complex. They actually use a relationship uh, considering, because the size of these is so different, they consider this kind of like a point charge with a certain charge density, and this like a large plane. But in the end, they're able to calculate that this force is less than one nanonewton. So in pure magnitudes, we can say that approximately we have uh, a capillary force that's about equal to the adhesion force plus the electrostatic force. But it turns out that when you consider the uh, vector directions of these forces, uh, it's most likely that the capillary force significantly exceeds these other two forces. In other words, the net force in this direction is heavily dominated by the capillary force. And another thing that's, that's interesting and important is that if you look at how the forces scale, uh, for example, the capillary force scales if our small r is taken to be the radius of the particle, it's kind of loosely determining the radius of this meniscus at the small sizes. Uh, the capillary force scales as r, but the double layer force scales as r squared, which says that uh, the electrostatic repulsion is going to get bigger faster than the capillary force is going to get bigger. 
uh, as the particle size gets larger, and therefore they suggest that this method may not work for particles larger than a size of about 30 nanometers. And they didn't test this, but they say that the reason this works is because of the dominance of the capillary force over the strengths of the other interactions at these size scales. And one more thing that they find to be important uh, is, you know, we talked about the adhesion uh, between the particles and the substrate uh, due to, uh, you know, particular Van der Waals interaction. And certainly, if you modify the substrate chemically or coat it with something, you could change perhaps the strength of that interaction. And they talk about in the early stages of the paper how they had to figure out how to balance the strength of adhesion between the quantum dot and the substrate. So it's kind of not too weak, but not too strong. So they would get the quantum dots to stick on the substrate uh, and stay there after they washed it, uh, but not stick when they didn't want them to stick in the spaces between the spheres. So for example, if they uh, have a clean substrate, just glass that they haven't modified in any way, they see that they get their, in all the cases they get their rings, but they get a bunch of quantum dots in different places in between them. Uh, and, and then what they did is they found out that if they coat it with uh, a polymer, for example, a photoresist or PVP, another polymer, they're able to prevent the uh, adsorption of the quantum dots just from solution. But in the case where they coat it with photoresist, the problem is that the adhesion is so weak that when they wash the substrate, the rings go away. But if they use this other polymer, the adhesion is strong enough such that they can wash it off and keep the rings there, but it's not too strong that they get a lot of quantum dots sticking in the spaces between the rings. And then as another limiting case, they said, well, what if we, say, functionalize the surface of our glass with an acid, a molecule that really likes the functional group that they had on the quantum dot surfaces, and here they form the rings too, but you can see they get a lot of sticking of the particles in the spaces between the rings. So uh, that suggests that you know, this kind of process control of compatibility is another important aspect, and here it's just kind of qualitative where they compared getting things in the right place versus getting things in the wrong place. So a, a second example relates to an extension beyond what we saw before uh, with templated particle assembly. So you know, like we uh, can assemble microspheres by these you know, capilla lateral capillary pressures and get fairly well-packed structures, we saw efforts to place these particles in physical templates at certain locations. And we saw uh, about a week ago this idea of geometric compatibility of, say, changing the diameter of this cavity and uh, then getting just one sphere in or two spheres in or three spheres in and so on. But what this kind of uh, doesn't address very precisely is how, if you had an array of identically sized holes, how different sized particles may stick in those holes or not stick in those holes. For example, if you had a hole of, say, a size diameter d, is there a greater probability of a, a particle that's just slightly smaller uh, or a slightly larger one, both being smaller than the hole, in sticking there? So uh, this kind of problem has been addressed or studied by doing this templated self-assembly uh, in, a, in a system where you also apply some ultrasonic agitation. So uh, these researchers uh, made substrates, which we'll see how they're made in a minute, uh, with these kind of hemispherical cavities in them and uh, functionalized the substrate so they had a hydrophobic monolayer in the cavity and also functionalized the particles so they had a hydrophobic surface. So that means the particles liked the cavities. But as they changed the size of the cavity, uh, by very small increments relative to the size of the particle, as well as applied ultrasonic vibration, they found that they were able to change the probability that a particle will land in a cavity of a certain size. In other words, if the particle matches the cavity very well, the total interaction energy is higher, and it's more likely to be able to resist the tendency to roll out due to the ultrasonic vibration. And the paper goes through a discussion of all the kinds of, uh, of, of agitations that happen due to ultrasonics, the fluid motion, the, the vertical force, the rolling force, and so on. And basically they say that 
what dominates this process is the uh, rolling uh, removal method which results from the agitation and then the resultant torque due to a force being exerted about this pivot. But you're literally uh, essentially shaking the particles outside of these cavities. And so uh, this uh, plot at the left shows their fabrication process for these small cavities. It was just done by a top-down method. It was done by lithography. And what they did is they used e-beam lithography to pattern uh, small holes very precisely, submicron holes uh, or holes of a few microns. So they, uh, you did e-beam lithography on a photoresist on a silica substrate, a glass substrate. And then they put it in a wet etching solution, which undercut the uh, hole they made. And by this method, they were able to make different gaps in the layer at the top. And then by putting in an etchant solution, if the gap was wider, then the etchant would go wider. And therefore, they could create a substrate with four different hole widths or hole sizes, sort of A, B, C, and D. And these are AFM scans of the widths of the holes, the cavities they produced. And you can see, for example, they went from having a, a narrower cavity to a wider cavity. And this was just by controlling the size of this initial opening they made in their etched template. And then after they did the etching process, they removed the photoresist, and then they coated it with a hydrophobic monolayer, which had affinity for the particles in solution. <clears throat> so here are some, uh, here's a picture of some of their results. Uh, and uh, each of these squares uh, is kind of a unit cell. And so each square has uh, holes of small, a bit larger, a bit larger, and the largest. And all the particles they use are smaller than the holes that they have. And what they found out is that uh, under agitation, they were able to design the process so they got particles to always go in the smallest holes. In other words, the holes that had more contact and a better match with the particle size in solution. But as the hole size increased, the uh, relative number of holes that were filled decreased. Uh, to the limit where in their largest size of hole, size D, which is the top right corners of all the cells, they had no particles remaining. And so they basically turned a process that would really be, you know, random of particles coming in and colliding uh, with, the, with the hole and sticking to a, a process that was deterministic within these bounds. They could, by just changing that hole size, they could get all the holes to be filled or all the holes to be empty. And that's a step beyond having just, you know, saying, well, if I, hold this, uh, if I have a hole of this size, I'm just going to get one particle, or a hole of another size, I'm going to get two particles. And they quantified this uh, in terms of uh, different parameters. They varied. And you know, we can look at, for example, the bottom uh, plot where they've plotted the yield as a function of the net removal torque. And they calculated this net removal torque uh, based on the geometry of the cavity and the geometry of the sphere. So if there was more of a mismatch between the sphere and the cavity, there was more of a tendency for the, 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 the particle to be removed. And you can see that as the uh, yield goes down, the torque goes up. Or as the torque goes up, the yield goes down, meaning that more, t more applied torque was more effective at removing particles from, uh, from the cavities. So that's the, the, the conclusion of the second example, which just shows a, a way to now externally manipulate the strength of these interactions where it got down to how well the particles were adhered in holes of different sizes and how much energy was applied to try to get them out of a part of a cavity that isn't the right size. So the, the third example uh, talks about uh, a way to control the growth orientation of nanotubes by applying electric fields. And uh, we discussed the example shown on this slide earlier, where uh, I, I, we introduced this as an example of combining the top-down and bottom-up processing to get individual nanotubes to bridge uh, physical islands. And, and we saw that, uh, in this case, the geometric design of the island kind of focused the nanotube as it grew. And the one nanotube that was able to grow along, the, along to this tip and then start its journey and wiggle its way across was likely to bridge this gap. 
and uh, we saw from their results that by changing this geometric design, the number of islands with single nanotubes bridging them was higher because of the way uh, the uh, nanotube spanned this gap. Whereas in the top left, there were a large number of nanotubes that were growing across the gap. So now we'll talk about a slightly different process with uh, a somewhat different goal, but that is to uh, apply an electric field to influence the growth direction of nanotubes. So now, instead of having these focused islands, what we're going to have is a uh, uniform gap, and we're going to see the effect of applying a voltage across the gap in influencing the alignment of the nanotubes across the trench. And these are the results of this study that was done actually almost 10 years ago at Stanford. And uh, in the general case, if you have uh, islands. These are microfabricated islands that are coated with catalyst for uh, for nanotube growth. And you put the the, the substrate in a furnace. Uh, this is a low density of catalyst, so you're getting a film, not a forest. The nanotubes that start growing from the islands are going to be wiggling in random directions, and then eventually some of them are going to end up attached to the other side. And when they attach to the other side, the strength of the van der Waals forces kind of anchors them down. And we see on the left side that their growth direction is generally random. Uh, there's nothing which is dictating that they should go straight across the trench, and we can see that some kind of hit other ones and form these interesting branch structures. And so this is kind of the nominal case where uh, you wouldn't be applying an electric field across this gap. And on the right side, we see a case where uh, they applied an electric field, and they did experiments with both DC and AC fields, uh, between two electrodes that were on opposite sides of the catalyst patches. And what's seen here is that the electric field that's applied has the effect of orienting the nanotubes uh, preferentially across the gap. So there's an orientation force that exists on the nanotube because it's a conductor and is influencing its effect to grow in a particular direction. In other words, it's counteracting the tendency of the nanotube to vibrate due to thermal energy uh, in, in this hot growth environment. And uh, this slide just shows uh, their uh, fabrication process for these substrates. Uh, for example, they use a, a layer of polysilicon on quartz uh, as their electrodes, because polysilicon has a, a electrical conductivity. It's a semiconductor. And uh, then they contact print catalyst on the tops of the electrodes and these islands in the center. And then they grow uh, with an electric field applied by putting electrodes here and here. Uh, and uh, you generally get nanotube growth across the gap, like so. And, and these experiments were done on the same substrates. Only one on the previous slide didn't have the electric field applied, and the other one had the electric field applied. And these are snapshots from a further study that just kind of tries to graphically depict the mechanism of th this isolated nanotube growth from one post to another. And the idea is that as the nanotube starts growing, it's kind of wiggling around. And then once it finds the other post or the other island, it sort of sets its position. And uh, then that influences the subsequent growth process. For example, if another nanotube were to start from this island and grow, uh, grow it might actually stick itself to the next one and follow the same path across. And this is also showing the difference that might exist if you had, you know, trenches or you have posts, in this case you could you know, either cross from here to here or here to here or here to here. But the same idea of like being this balance of thermal vibrations and any other applied influence would affect the ability of the nanotubes to span this gap. So the, the, the study that did the electric field uh, vibration discussed about the balance of forces in the system, uh, specifically the balance between the uh, ability of the electric field to align the nanotubes and their inherent thermal vibration due to the high temperature ambient. And so they did some calculations uh, based on these two scaling laws. So it turns out that what actually happens to the nanotubes as they're in this electric field is because they have a, a polarizability, essentially a conductivity that's much greater along their axis, there's not a pulling force on them, but there's a torque, there's a restoring force, or essentially a force influencing them to grow straight along the direction of the electric field. So this diagram considers, for example, if you have a nanotube that's 
uh, oriented at a particular angle theta with respect to the electric field. If it's kind of offline, there will be a force applied resulting from the electric field that wants to orient it back and parallel to the field and across the gap. And this force scales with the polarizability of the nanotube and the electric field squared and relates to the uh, angle in the system. So you can see that if the nanotube is perfectly aligned with the field, uh, there is no force because sine of theta is zero. But if the, uh, if the angle is not zero, then there is a, uh, a net, there is a force that tends to restore it. And so they then calculate a resulting torque uh, and moment on the nanotube. And by doing some more uh, involved uh, calculations, they can compare this to the magnitude of the thermal vibration. And so uh, in separately, it's also possible to estimate the uh, oscillation amplitude of the tip of the nanotube uh, at a certain temperature. So the nanotube is like a cantilever beam. And due to a certain temperature, it'll have a certain amount of thermal energy. And you can consider it just as a thermally driven oscillator. In fact, back in the day, the first um, measurements of the modulus of nanotubes were done by looking at the magnitude of thermal vibration and backing out the modulus based on the dimension. But they can calculate that at a certain temperature, the nanotube is going to be wiggling around with a certain average amplitude. And what they do is they calculate that if you had a single wall nanotube that's 2 nanometers in diameter and 20 microns long uh, with no applied field, essentially no fields that kind of keep it centered, its tip vibration at 900 C would be 6 microns. So it really is waving around like crazy. And that's aside of anything else in the atmosphere. Maybe uh, there would be a gas flow or something that would be influencing it. But now we'll assume it's just the electric field and the thermal vibration. However, if they apply an electric field of about a volt per micron, they can significantly narrow that amplitude of vibration. Considering that the thermal vibration is you know, kind of a random vibration, but as the nanotube vibrates farther from the central direction, then it's a feeling an increasing penalty based on the electric field for going a certain distance. So the electric field essentially confines its vibration to a very small range and therefore moves it in the desired direction. And by balancing these through further calculations, they estimate that the amplitude of this vibration is much smaller, less than a micron, when the field is applied. And they talk about the threshold voltages and compare those to the results of their experiment. And as a final control, they uh, study uh, the fact that if they uh, don't suspend the nanotubes, yet they apply the electric field, there is no alignment. So in other words, instead of having the catalyst up on these islands, which gives the nanotubes a chance to grow free across the gap, they look at catalysts down on the floor where the nanotubes are going to start growing, and they're just going to be stuck on the ground. And uh, they can see that without and with an electric field, there's no uh, difference, general difference, in the growth directions. And uh, this also raises another interesting issue. Uh, in some cases, actually, the characteristics of the substrate can influence the growth direction when the nanotubes are in contact with the substrate. Uh, and there's a lot of subsequent work on directing nanotube growth laterally using single crystal substrates. Basically, the fact that the asymmetry in uh, Van der Waals interactions between a nanotube and a different direction uh, on a single crystal can actually f influence it to grow in a, particular, in, a, in a particular way. And that's probably the most popular way now to grow nanotubes directed in a horizontal direction. Okay. I had another uh, short example on using electric fields to place uh, nanoparticles, but uh, in, in the interest of time, uh, we're going to skip over that, and I'll go on to this, uh, this next uh, example. So the next example relates to balances between capillary forces and van der Waals forces and elastic forces in considering how filaments, so not nanoparticles, but long uh, slender beams might be grouped together by uh, uh, elastic and capillary interactions. And the starting point for this study uh, is uh, a paper in 2004 uh, which uh, demonstrated the ability to use a top-down method, use lithography and deep reactive ion etching to fabricate uh, silicon posts that have diameters in the nanoscale regime. 
So this is not, these aren't nanowires grown by the VLS method, but they're silicon posts that are maybe a, a few hundred, five hundred, uh, or fewer nanometers in diameter and a few microns high. And they're fabricated just by lithography, very fine lithography and, and vertical etching of silicon. And these are pictures of posts uh, fabricated under different conditions. And incidentally, this study uh, talked about the properties of these kind of nails as non-wetting surfaces. And uh, we see here, what they did is they put a, a drop of polymer on the surface, and then they solidified the polymer, and they looked at the bottom surface of the solidified droplet. And these are actually the dimples on the bottom of this solid polymer droplet that resulted from it sitting on the top of the nails. In other words, it was not wetting, it was not filling in, it was just sitting on the tops of those surfaces. But what we're going to talk about is uh, studies of how uh, drying of liquids cause structures like these to aggregate. And uh, what uh, a few years later uh, some researchers from the same collaboration did is they started with these uh, silicon structures which are relatively stiff and they Uh, they were able to replicate them in polymers. So they take this, these silicon pillar arrays, so the same kind of things we saw before, only it seems like they're a bit spaced out, and they use uh, polymer replication, soft lithography, to transfer their shape to basically create a copy in an epoxy, in a polymer. And so what they do is they take their silicon pillar array and they coat it with PDMS, uh, uh, polydimethyl siloxane, uh, and this is an elastomeric polymer, and they can cure this on it, and then uh, they also coat the silicon with a chemical that prevents uh, adhesion between the PDMS and the silicon, and then they can peel away this PDMS flexible polymer, and they end up with basically a negative mold of this silicon post array. And then they simply uh, cast epoxy onto this PDMS negative, and then they're able to remove the PDMS negative, and they end up with an array of polymer pillars. And the reason they were interested in the polymer pillars is because of other ways to functionalize their surfaces, and also because their mechanical stiffness is significantly lower. And now we're going to see what happens because of the low mechanical stiffness of these polymers. And here's a picture of the negative in the PDMS where instead of the wires, you see the holes. And it uh, looks this funny color because it's a polymer and it's charging uh, locally around the locations of the holes. And what they studied was the behavior of these, uh, these pillars to aggregate due to a balance of elastic forces and capillary forces. And this is, this is a, a different uh, thing, but it's the same phenomenon of what's called elastocapillary coalescence. And what elastocapillary coalescence is, it's basically a balance between elastic forces and capillary forces that, uh, be, uh, that relates to how thin beams group together when they dry. And, and uh, this is exactly the same process that happens, for example, as long hair gets drawn out of water or long hair dries, or how when you draw a paintbrush out of a bucket of paint, how the paint bristles get grouped together. And it turns out the mechanics of this process, if you consider each filament to be a little beam uh, and to be, for example, like uniformly spaced like this, is kind of a hierarchical aggregation process. And uh, going through the math of the strength of the capillary forces and the mechanics necessary to deform these beams uh, and bring them together uh, describes how this process happens hierarchically. For example, how maybe far away from the liquid you would have one bundle of filaments, but farther up toward the top you would have the filaments that are more spaced out together. So you can kind of get these branched aggregates to, to come together based on this balance between elastic forces and capillary forces. And these are done for things that are in the, the millimeter scale, but the same phenomenon uh, happens at the nanoscale. Only the relative strengths of capillary forces are often uh, can be larger. <clears throat> so what uh, the researchers working with the nanopillars observed is that uh, they were able to control how these little polymer pillars grouped when they wet them and dried them. 
And so they make the polymer pillars in the array where they're all straight and standing, and then they put, uh, immerse them in a liquid, just take the substrate and put it in a dish, and then they let the liquid evaporate. And uh, the figure at the left summarizes what happens during evaporation as they, uh, for example, decrease the diameter of the pillars so their bending stiffness decreases, or increase their length so their bending stiffness decreases. Uh, and uh, what they uh, are saying here or showing is that by doing that, you're basically increasing the relative strength of the capillary forces with respect to the uh, bending stiffness, and therefore you can get the pillars to aggregate. And so aggregation means that the uh, capillary forces are greater than the forces necessary to bend the structures and pull them together, and that after the liquid evaporates, that the adhesion forces, the van der Waals forces between the pillars, are strong enough so they remain stuck together and they don't spring back. And uh, what they show is that when you're in a regime where uh, these, uh, the capillary forces can bring the pillars together, and when the adhesion forces are strong enough to keep the pillars stuck together, the pillars end up grouped together. And not only are they grouped together, but they're grouped together in some very interesting ways. Uh, but uh, to follow this chart, uh, we see that uh, at the top, when, for example, the pillars are stiffer than the capillary forces, uh, or, they, uh, or uh, the surface interactions are not strong enough to keep them together when they dry, they get pulled together and then they spring back. So you end up in top view exactly what you started with. And then as the uh, relative strength of the capillary forces or the relative strength of the elastic increases or the elastic forces decrease, you go to a situation where you start to end up with fibers that are grouped together, bunched together in, in for example, clusters of four like this. Uh, to where they're actually twisted together because, there's the, because they're being brought closer together, to where you take over bigger and bigger groups and you end up with these kind of helical structures that they call helical bristles. And you can see here that they've made these happen. They've uh, increased the relative influence of the capillary forces by making the filaments much longer and therefore they can come together over broader distance and they not only end up clumped together but they end up twisted together in this way that people hadn't observed before. And you can see that like these pictures show kind of like very perfect order but over a larger scale uh, you know the, 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 the placement of the filaments that group together is uh, kind of random. So you have some areas where there's a row of, of little X's and then the placement of the row changes and then occasionally you have defects. But given the uh, relative stiffness of these structures, in this case, like it's not likely that you're gonna get a bigger group because the energetic cost to pull one from farther away to join this cluster is much higher. And so this was a balance between bending energy and capillary forces and adhesion energy. So the two things we saw before and one thing that wasn't uh, at play when we were talking about uh, talking about uh, nanoparticles and spheres. And in fact, uh, what they, they observe is that in these large clusters, they actually get a helical aggregation. So these actually form these really beautiful twisted bristles and uh, it's some kind of elastic energy minimization that lets these twist up like that. So you can imagine that as the liquid is evaporating, the filaments kind of settle and form this twisted structure. Uh, it's not entirely clear beyond that description how these form in their paper, but another uh, uh, attribute of the structures is that you notice that they have these little scallops. They look kind of like little striped worms on their surfaces. Uh, th does anyone know where those might come from? No? It's something in the fabrication process. So, so actually, what, what I think they're from is when they initially etch the silicon pillars, the, the, the reactive ion etching process, because of vertical etching of silicon, it, it re results in a scalloped sidewall because th that etching process pulses the gas and creates these kind of little terraces. It's an inherent attribute of the process, and that ends up being replicated in the sidewalls of these pillars. And so the ability to control that texture might be a way to get different types of grouping. And uh, at the end of their paper, they show uh, 
an interesting thing that when they do this process, they uh, evaporate the uh, solution, the liquid, in uh, a presence of some microspheres. So they just have some microspheres in the solution. Uh, when there's affinity between the microspheres and the, and, the, and the polymer, they actually end up grabbing some of the spheres. So, so the, the, the assembly, if it's in proximity to a sphere, ends up enveloping a sphere and is kind of uh, grabbing it, kind of trapping it like an adhesive. And then uh, they remove the spheres, uh, they either etch them away or they put it in a liquid where they jumped out and uh, they still observe these kind of uh, helical uh, whirlpool type structures, they called them. And uh, this, this picture was on the cover of the journal in which it was published and uh, it was also entered in, a, in, a, in an art contest. The MRS has this contest called Science is Art where people can submit cool looking pictures from their research and their winning entry in the art contest put fingernails on all the little bristles, uh, which is kind of creepy. <laughs> and uh, the particle wasn't colored either. So there's another application to this phenomenon of balancing elastic forces and capillary forces. And, and one, uh, one uh, example of another application is uh, using capillary forces to densify carbon nanotubes. So one of the uh, really important issues in growth of vertical nanotube forests is even though the nanotubes have a nice preferential alignment and in some cases can be pretty straight, uh, the density as we know is low. And that means that uh, if you take some of these pillars as grown just from lithographically patterned catalysts and, for example, compress them, their uh, Young's modulus is very low because the nanotubes are behaving like a foam because there's so much space in between them. So in principle, if you could use a similar process of uh, uh, introduction and evaporation of liquid to infiltrate the nanotube pillar and uh, bring it together by this elastocapillary process, then it might be, able, might be possible to make denser nanotube structures with better mechanical properties. And so, you know, unlike uh, what uh, we saw in the previous example, each of these pillars is a whole bunch of long slender filaments. And uh, well, under certain conditions, what can be done is you can dip these nanotube forests into a liquid or condense a liquid onto the surface and evaporate it and uh, get, for example, a pillar like this to be uh, aggregated, to be densified into a denser structure, kind of a pin like that, where the density of the nanotubes is maybe a factor of 10 higher or more. And what the plot at the bottom right is showing is another attribute of this balance between elastic and capillary forces. In other words, it compares the uh, result of the uh, immersion and evaporation process uh, based on the geometry of the pillar that you start with. So take, for example, a pillar that's uh, relatively long and thin uh, and compare it with a pillar of the same height but a much larger diameter. And it turns out that uh, there are basically two regimes. There are regimes in which the, all the nanotubes get kind of bunched together into one single pillar. And then there's a regime in which the uh, final structure after evaporation of the liquid is kind of like a foam. In other words, they're randomly placed voids. And this can simply be thought of as uh, the fact that uh, there is too much elastic energy required to bring all the nanotubes from this wide space into the center, so they end up dividing into this kind of Swiss cheese type pattern. So uh, it turns out that if, if one studies uh, nanotube pillars of different uh, lengths or different heights and different diameters, uh, for example, in an experiment like this, you would see that the uh, ones of a certain height, you know, this is maybe 100 microns, uh, you could have some that are in this regime and some that are in that regime. But over a whole kind of two-dimensional space, uh, the uh, behavior of this agrees pretty well with the math for simple elastocapillary aggregation of filaments. And so it turns out that just densifying these structures uh, using this capillary process indeed increases their mechanical properties a whole lot. So uh, this is a diagram of a simple compression test that can be done on a microstructure. So just taking a, a nano indenter, so a, a, a basically a single axis loading machine with a very fine motion control and force sensor and fitting it with a flat diamond punch 
and using that diamond punch to squash a nanotube microstructure. So that's about 50 to 100 microns. And uh, as I mentioned before, the Young's modulus of these as-grown forests is really flimsy. It's like 50 megapascals. So that's uh, a typical foam that's way less than a typical polymer. Uh, however, if we, uh, in comparison, test the Young's modulus of a densified a pillar, so just a cylinder that's been densified by infiltration and evaporation of liquid, the modulus is about five gigapascals, so a factor of 100 higher, even though the density of the nanotubes is maybe only a factor of 10 higher. So that shows that bringing the tubes closer together is helping them reinforce and support one another upon introduction of this compressive load. And then after the densification has happened, it's also possible, for example, to infiltrate the nanotube pillars with polymers. Uh, like adding SU8, a photocurable epoxy, or PMMA, uh, another uh, typical, uh, typical resist material, and then can get further increases in the mechanical properties. So for example, up to 20 GPA or 25 GPA, where the modulus is estimated by the slope of the unloading curve. So this is stress and that strain, and this is created just by pressing the pillar and then releasing it like so. And the the curve for the as-grown nanotube pillar without densification is so low that it looks flat here, and we see it here up on a separate graph. So and you can see that now, now the properties of these nanotube pillars are competitive with polymers. So like SU8 or PMMA without any nanotubes in it is maybe two to four GPA in strength. So this now, this nanotube pillar without polymer now behaves like a normal polymer. And if you combine the polymer and the aligned nanotubes, you get something that is now maybe uh, a factor of 5 to 10 higher than a typical polymer. But if we think of aluminum, that's about 75 GPA, and steel is uh, about 200 GPA, and individual nanotubes are about 1,000 GPA. So these results are still maybe an order of magnitude beneath what you might want to achieve by ideally packing the tubes into a crystal. So uh, I think you know, these types of values can be increased as well, but here's a way to take advantage of these self-assembly interactions to manipulate uh, nanostructures into a more ordered and dense aggregate. Okay. So the last uh, topic for today is a short overview of uh, another approach to, to self-assembly, uh, and that's, uh, this is one that's been explored for, in various ways for about 20 years now, and this is to use the uh, tendency of DNA base pair binding to create some unique uh, self-assembled superstructures out of DNA. So in other words, what we're going to see is how uh, the ability to uh, design DNA strands to have specific sequences that will then interact with other specific sequences is another type of interaction that can be engineered. And it's different uh, than the other interactions we've studied because it relies on a hydrogen bonding interaction between uh, complementary DNA strands and also because it's a specific interaction because uh, if you're familiar with the design of the DNA double helix, uh, DNA consists of a sugar phosphate backbone with uh, combinations of four different uh, basis uh, called by the letters G, C, A, and T, and there's a complementary binding between A and T, adenine and thymine, and G and C, guanine and cytosine, meaning that you know G doesn't bind to A, for example. So if you have uh, two uh, strands, single strands of DNA with sequences of these bases that uh, have complementary matching, that's what causes the DNA strand to self-assemble into a double helix. And of course, in, uh, in biology, DNA, there are all these beautiful machines that create and replicate and repair DNA and so on. Uh, all we're going to see here is now how this kind of interaction can be used to self-assemble some things. Uh, and, and I think there's a lot of opportunity and will be a lot of growth in this area, even aside from the ways that DNA is treated inside biological systems. But it's just the fact that we, we've understood DNA from studying biology and that we have a lot of tools to synthesize DNA in particular sequences that has enabled the results we're going to discuss in a moment. And there have been a, a number of examples of using DNA to uh, assemble uh, lattices. Uh, like, for example, imagine taking uh, DNA strands and 
and, 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 and uh, giving them base pair sequence so they might assemble into grids or into other structures. Uh, and, but the first example I'll choose to highlight here is uh, using DNA to uh, try to control the assembly of uh, gold nanoparticles. And what was done here is these uh, researchers uh, designed DNA sequences uh, so they could be bound to gold nanoparticles uh, using the thiol gold sequence, the same uh, interaction that we talked about in the case of self-assembled monolayers. And they engineered the st strands that they bound to the gold nanoparticles so they would be complementary. So for example, schematically here, if we take a look at the uh, blue and the red, uh, that's a sequence of 15 base pairs, so 15 letters on each side that was designed to match exactly the 15 letters on the opposite strand. So the 15 red are, are, are complementary to the 15 blue. And then they also optionally put strands of DNA that uh, were spacers between the particles and the section that bound. And they could, for example, in different systems, which we won't talk about, change the relative lengths of these linkers. And they were basically, by engineering this kind of interaction, uh, controlling the, the, the balance between an attractive potential and a repulsive potential. In other words, the attractive potential is the desire of these two uh, unpaired DNA strands that are complementary to want to zip together. And the repulsive potential is the repulsion between these linkers and linkers on opposite structures because they had a net negative charge and they wanted to separate out. And so what they did is they designed these particular binding systems. Basically now think we have particles that have their, you know, the, that are the half of the desired final pair and you mix them together and put them in solution and vary the temperature versus time uh, to control how the red and blue hook together. And uh, what happens with DNA is if you control the temperature of its environment, uh, you can basically melt it and solidify it. In other words, there are, uh, there are denaturing temperatures at which the, the bound pairs come apart and go together. And so by controlling this temperature profile, of these two uh, sort of uh, DNA coated particles in solution, they were able to end up with a final crystal structure and in fact showed that they were able to create uh, what would be like super crystals consisting of uh, gold nanoparticles connected by DNA, DNA in uh, a BCC lattice. And uh, uh, there were different conditions under which they got uh, this crystalline structure forming and there were other conditions in which they ended up with an amorphous structure. In other words, no crystallization. And it turned out that we see here, they're saying that in the two right-hand cases, they ended up with crystalline order. And in the left-hand cases, they ended up with just amorphous structures. And that was in the end related to the balance between these different types of interactions. In other words, the flexibility of this chain uh, and the repulsive interactions with other chains that let the particles kind of move around and find the right place, as well as the specificity of this linking interaction. And when you had too much of just this linker interaction and no flexibility of the particles to move and space one another out, then you didn't get this crystal. But when you had the linker and the spacer in the right balance, you ended up with a finally ordered system. And so, uh, I think you know, this required a lot of engineering of the conditions and of this particular strands, but they were able to study the process uh, by uh, x-ray scattering. And uh, basically what we'll see here is this is a, a diagram of their setup. So they used a synchrotron uh, where they had a test tube with their solution with the, uh, the DNA coated particles in it and they passed the x-ray beam through that test tube and they collected scattering patterns uh, of what was going on in the system. And uh, we remember from x-ray scattering just in general that if you have peaks then you have crystals. And so they saw as they controlled the temperature of this process 
they were able to eventually cool the system down in a controlled way so they had highly ordered crystalline structures. So now taking the types of particles that we saw at the right on the previous slide and taking them through a temperature excursion, they ended up with an image that showed these, uh, these rings considering consisting uh, or indicating a pretty good crystalline order. And this means that you have clumps of highly ordered particles all in different orientations. So you see rings corresponding to the lattice spacings. But you know here, the lattice spacings don't correspond to the spacing of atoms in the gold particles, but correspond to the spacing between gold particles in this like a crystal that the DNA is holding together. And so what they did is they started out and you see that in the first solution, uh, when they just mixed the particles together, they had maybe a little bit of order because the par some particles kind of came together and were locally ordered, but really it wasn't very good overall. And then they take it up to about 70 C. So uh, this is maybe 150 Fahrenheit. And they have no order because all the DNA bonds are unbound and the particles are just flopping around. And then they cool it down very slowly and they end up at uh, about 30 C, which I guess is, is uh, uh, close to, to, to body temperature, uh, or some, maybe about 10, 20 Fahrenheit below body temperature, they uh, end up with this highly ordered result. And you can see here the uh, TEM images of the individual particles, and then an amorphous aggregate, and finally a crystalline aggregate, where we can get the kind of a sense of how the particles were well packed together. So in general, the ability to kind of engineer these interactions is a way that we might be able to control the assembly of nanostructures in the future. And I think researchers are asking themselves now, uh, you know, how can we uh, understand better how to hook DNA together in fancy ways? Or how can we emulate what DNA does in terms of having this specific chemical binding in other structures? For example, you could, you could say, can we make nanowires that have this specific coating on them? Or can we use other biomolecules like you know, proteins and peptides to do similar things? And there's a lot of work along those directions as well. One of the uh, advantages of this DNA process is that you can piggyback on all the technology of DNA sequencing and, and kind of programming and, 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 and being able to go to a website and dial up a sequence you want and a few days later get a vial of your desired molecule. But a downside is that it's not very mechanically robust, it's not very thermally stable, but it provides a really interesting platform for, for engineering some new types of structures. And another uh, approach to uh, DNA assembly is what was, what was called uh, by uh, Paul Rothman at Caltech who started this uh, DNA origami. And, and what he means by DNA origami is just thinking of uh, taking strands of DNA and, and folding them together like you might fold a piece of paper. And this schematic is just meant to show uh, his design for, uh, for example, taking DNA strands and each color here represents a different single strand of DNA and understanding how to design the strand, so basically design the letter sequence of it, so it'll want to, by this same type of heating and cooling process, form something like a sheet. And a sheet where you have one very, very long backbone strand, this black strand here that goes through the sheet like that, and then uh, a whole bunch of what he calls staple strands that act to make the backbone mechanically rigid. And that means that the blue ones and the orange ones and the red ones and the green ones are different in their overall sequence. And they're meant to connect certain patches of the black backbone strand. And he says he calls it origami because uh, of the way that uh, he wants this structure to fold. And there are other aspects of the engineering, for example, in uh, engineering the sequence of the black strand here uh, to have a, a preferential place where it's going to where it's going to want to fold and take this kind of hairpin turn. And so what this paper did is he demonstrated this kind of design concept uh, and approach for stitching DNA in a whole bunch of different patterns. So I'm sorry, I forgot the the length scale here, but uh, we can consider that you know, DNA is about a couple nanometers uh, in size, so these are really scales, these are features with uh, far you know, nanoscale texture. And so by uh, 
de designing the two-dimensional folding pattern and stapling pattern of this lattice, he was able to make all these structures and all these little smiley faces and take uh, images of them with the AFM uh, and also make these kind of triangular structures like so. And there's a uh, very recent work from uh, a group at, at Harvard that has taken this approach and extended it to three dimensions and basically figured out how to design the strands to get three-dimensional folding and, and connection in some interesting topographies to make things like rods and also boxes and kind of prismatic structures. And both of those groups, this group and the Harvard group, actually have software you can download that in some form is letting you sketch the final pattern you want to achieve and then it'll kind of it'll it'll produce a sequence of letters for you that you can then order and eventually put the DNA together. I think a lot of other understanding of the important factors is involved, but in principle what they're aiming for is an ability to code the self-assembly of DNA into interesting patterns. And also there's been further work on say hooking gold nanoparticles or carbon nanotubes to these structures and trying to place them deterministically. So the last slide I have for today is a, a, another paper from the same group at, at Caltech uh, where it's taking these triangular structures made by DNA self-assembly and, and, and studying how they might dock on uh, lithographically templated substrates. So they basically, in short, uh, use top-down processing, use lithography to create a, a pattern of triangular recesses and patches that have chemical affinity for the DNA in triangles in solution and they study the ability to place them with specific positional registry and also register their orientation so they face in a certain direction. And the comparison is between this kind of uh, uh, triangular template approach and a linear template approach where in both cases by making the affinity you can get the DNA to go in the place you want, but this uh, triangular cavity uh, facilitates registry and uh, fairly good control of the orientation. So uh, that's all I had for today, and uh, see you next Monday at 6 p.m. and also for the meetings tomorrow. <laughs>